Our first presenters are Jeff McMillan and Barbara Ruminski. Jeff, Jeff McMillan is San Francisco Opera's Director of Public Relations and a member of ARSC since 2009 when his book, Delightfully, The Life and Music of Lee Morgan received ARSC's Certificate of Merit. He's written about jazz and opera for the Grove Dictionary of American Music and other publications. For 10 years, he was an archivist at the Metropolitan and holds an MA in jazz history and research for Rutgers University. Barbara Rominski is the founding director of the Edward Paul Raby Archives at the San Francisco Opera in the Diane B. Wilsey Center for Opera. She joined San Francisco Opera in 2016, following a 13-year stint with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where she was head of the Research Library, Archives, and Records Management Program, and serves as a consultant for several arts and cultural organizations. Jeff and Barbara, take it away. Thank you, Tom. My screen coming through all right? Excellent, thank you. Beginning in September of this year, San Francisco Opera will become only the third American opera company to present its 100th season. In recognition of this milestone, we are presenting to you streaming the first century, or as we prefer to call it, broadcasts and bootlegs. But first, a very brief history of opera in San Francisco and our company in particular, just to ground us. January, 1848, Sutter's Mill, California, gold. By 1849, gold fever, gold delirium had set in. San Francisco exploded from a sleepy little settlement of 1,000 to 25,000 souls in 12 short months. Overnight, new arrivals found great fortune or suffered devastating ruin. Social norms were turned upside down, bravura and showmanship were rewarded. Anything, absolutely anything was possible. Is it any surprise then that opera, grand opera, was seized upon as the most popular form of entertainment? By 1906, the gold rush may have been a distant memory, but the love of opera had never been greater in San Francisco. As devastating as the earthquake of 1906 was, two things of note followed it. One, with the near total destruction of the city's theaters, a campaign arose to build a dedicated opera house in the Civic Center. And two, Gaetano Merola, a Neapolitan by birth, musician and conductor by trade, visited San Francisco for the first time. Maestro Merola fell in love with our city, returning regularly with various touring companies. By 1921, he was convinced that San Francisco could support its own home company, and lucky for him, he also found himself deeply embedded in a robust, opera-loving Italian community, willing to back him up. After a successful trial season in 1922, Maestro Merrill gathered his resources and founded the San Francisco Opera Association in 1923. That first season lasted 13 days, 10 different operas were performed, nine out of the 10, Italian, of course, and nearly every performance sold at capacity in an auditorium that sat 5,000 plus people. The long photo here is the earliest I have in the archival collection. It's from 1923. The second production of our season was Andre Chenier. And here you see the company gathered together in our original home, the Civic Auditorium. Front and center and circled in red is our finding director, Mr. Merla, as well as the insert. He's seated next to his wife, Rosa, board members, singers, chorus, and the orchestra. Fast forward to 1932, the company having taken root in the broader San Francisco community realizes their dream of having a proper theater. In October of 1932, the War Memorial Opera House opened its doors, inviting San Franciscans into its new home with a performance of Tosca. Fadia Muzio sang the title role, Dino Borgioli was Cabaradosi, and Alfredo Gandolfi was Scarpia but more on that performance later. As you can see from the photos here, the house looks very much the same today as it would have back on that October evening. All right, now we're gonna leap forward 90 years. Centennial season, 2022, versus centennial anniversary, 2023. 
Fortunately for us, our seasons, fall performances followed by summer performances now cross over a calendar year. So two birds, one stone, which brings us to why all of us are gathered here today. Jeff? Yeah, so how should an institution look back on its first 100 years? With opera, we thought it was pretty straightforward. We need to share the art that the company has put on the stage. So first of all, this project that we're gonna talk about today is about performances and it's about music, it's about the singing and the craft. Though times and tastes have changed throughout the past century, there is a reason that San Francisco opera is about to reach that incredibly rare milestone of 100 years. It's that experience in the theater. And we are still at it, you know, singing these stories and creating new ones uh, that make us laugh, make us cry, make us feel alive. But the opportunity here was to establish a dialogue between our past and the present. It's been clear that just as all of us on the staff have been looking forward to the centennial, our audience is just as excited or perhaps even more so because you know, we have subscribers that have been with us for 50 years. We have people you know, who kind of linger in the lobby at performances and kind of hold court telling great stories about the great performances they heard. We have those excited newcomers you know, who came on a date and are coming back because they're ready for more. So how to curate a streaming experience that satisfies everyone, the aficionados, the newbies, the opera curious. Well, we've been at it for a century and we've been fortunate enough to have stockpiled quite a, an arsenal of audio treasures. And now is the time to choose some of them and share. So we wanted to, we want people to dive in to this project and into the rabbit hole and say, whoa, you know, that's amazing. Or what is this, you know, and just, uh, explore. So in shaping the project, we had a few goals in mind for this. Um, number one, it must be free and accessible to everyone. So the platform had to be web-based. You know, this wasn't going to be something you had to go into the gift shop at a show and uh, purchase. Also, number two, active participation. We wanted navigation and discovery to be an essential part of this experience. So there's necessarily, you know, there's not necessarily a linear path in this rabbit hole. Number three, it's important to represent a diversity of perspectives, both in the historical stories that we share and the contemporary storytellers. Number four, we must balance performance audio with storytelling and insight into the various crafts that opera better than any other art form weaves together. And lastly, it should have a, a sustained delivery schedule. We didn't wanna have this be a big data dump from great stuff from the archives. We wanted to kind of draw it out and have it interact with our season as we go through 2022-23. So content, the main idea or the main event of this project are the San Francisco opera performances we've selected. And these represent the different managerial regimes, the artistic priorities of past music directors. And most of all, these are moments that are unique to this company. We selected performances that were not only excellent, but ones that, represent, uh, that are not represented by a commercial recording with similar singers, or ones that we've made available in the past through, you know, maybe during the pandemic, our live stream or our streaming or past DVDs or CDs. Our choices would be unique San Francisco opera gems that maybe haven't seen the light of day since they happened at some point in the last century. So once we'd settled on the full titles, the core of the project, we started to talk through what contextual content we wanted to orbit those performances. For me, coming from the archive perspective, I wanted to give folks the context within which these performances took place, which means providing the historic ephemera, the cast and crew information, program books, articles written back then, press reviews, backstage and production photographs, that kind of stuff. We also have this really rich vein of recorded conversations, interviews, and panel discussions that we're drawing from. Starting in the 1970s, our radio broadcasts included intermission features, and we have many of them. Maestro Calvin Simmons talking with Richard Radzinski, Regina Resnick, Leontine Price with Otto Guth, Shirley Verrett, Vito Sayao, Sir Donald Runnicles with Lucas Meacham, 
Gwyneth Jones, Lottie Lehman, Pavarotti and Montserrat Caballé. The list goes on and on. It's like time traveling from the future. Once we'd worked through those options, we circled back to figure out how and where the contemporary voice was gonna fit in. Our general director has been adamant all along that our centennial celebration is as much, if not more, about looking to the future. But Jeff and I are history geeks. So how do we make a connection between the early years of the company to the present and into the future? We hit on a couple of brilliant ideas. In my role, I've connected with many people who have worked with the company in various capacities since the 1950s. So we decided to pair up early staffers with their current counterparts. Tom Munn, head of lighting in the 1960s, was paired with Justin Partier, our lighting director currently. They had an incredible conversation about the evolution of their craft. And throughout, Justin was totally fangirling or fangying. What we hadn't known was that Tom is a professional hero of Justin's, and he'd always wanted to meet him and to thank him for inspiring his love of lighting. The other brilliant idea comes from Jeff's love of musicology, his deep knowledge of writers who write beautifully and thoughtfully on the subject of opera with a capital O. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to speak up here. I saw a couple um, comments that maybe my volume's a little low, but... Um, yeah, the contemporary perspective. I'm so excited about the uh, contemporary voices that we have in this project. These are venerable guides who contextualize the performances and are able to open up new ways of listening and hearing. And it's, it's kind of amazing. It, it, what they've given us, it's kind of a mixture of liner notes, personal memoir, and uh, listening guides. In the four releases we have scheduled, we have Kip Krana, our dramaturg emeritus, and critic David Shingold in session one, baritone Kenneth Overton and Roger Pines will shepherd us through the French chapter, part two. Judith Malafronte and Mark Burford lead the way during the Italian focus session three. And lastly, Larry Roth and Paul Thomason for the German fourth session. And in between these writers and others chime in on some shorter musical excerpts, not the full performances, providing a, a kind of critical mosh pit or, you know, just it's like a battle royale of different factoids and viewpoints and things they all think are, are most important to say. So who knew that, you know, with opera, strong opinions and sometimes debate can arise. Jeff's been referring to sessions just now. So the overarching organization of the project is by language. What you're seeing on this slide is a sneak peek with plenty of information removed. We don't wanna to give too much away too soon. The sessions roll out one per month over the course of the fall season. They are Slavic, so Czech and Russian opera, French, Italian, and lastly, German. This order is designed to complement the productions that'll be on our stage in real time throughout the centennial. So because our Italian roots are strong, even to this day, let's take a sneak peek or a deeper dive into session three. From its first opening night, San Francisco Opera has presented some of the world's greatest opera singers. That was critical to Gaetano Merola's big audacious plan in 1922. And within that distinguished vocal ranks of, of our history, there are a few legendary figures such as our very first prima donna, Italian soprano, Claudia Muzio, a rich subject in session three. She made her operatic debut uh, just before World War I and right away made a recording of a dramatic scene from Verdi's La Traviata, which is a scene, not an aria, very unusual from that period. Uh, she performed in Italy and at the Met, Chicago, San Francisco. In South America, she was kind of had the status of a demigoddess or some kind of superhuman uh, artist. She died young in 1936, nearly broke, and having just made some of the most essential early electric period recordings of the Italian repertory, is kind of a last testament of a truly great artist. She was the idol of later singers like Maria Callas and Aprile Milo, and even today's stars like Eileen Perez. Muzio never would have been insta-famous or a YouTube influencer in our time. She was actually more like a recluse, and, but she came to life when she was on stage and that's where she gave everything. It must've been something to behold 
Uh, you read these reviews. I mean, she was crying real tears at the end of Traviata. She's giving herself bruises from throwing herself on the stairs in Cavalleria Rusticana. Fortunately, Gaetano Merola brought her to San Francisco often in our first decade, including to open the War Memorial Opera House in 1932. The only live recording of Muzio's voice that exists is act one of Tosca from that occasion, and you will be able to stream it. As an example of a contemporary voice dialoguing with the past in this project, we wanted to play two short snippets of Muzio related interviews that we conducted. First, there is Iris Siff, commentator of the Met Opera broadcasts on Saturdays, and an expert on historical voices, not to mention a Muzio superfan. When it comes to Muzio, these things that would happen, these uh, you read about them in the reviews, and there is an atmosphere that transcends even the normal, you know, we have artists that are loved, and, and, and we've all seen them, and we've seen audiences uh, become attached to them, or become attached to feeling they need to be at that show because that artist is very famous or got a lot of press. This was different. This was something personal where I feel the San Francisco audience loved her and loved her artistry and her voice, which is a compelling and... Has survived. Uh, the only problem is that, as far as I know, the original discs have been lost. Uh, I have been searching for them for 50 years since I was in... I first started making calls to collectors to try to find out where the original discs were back in the early 1970s. And I have made no progress in the past 50 years. No one seems to know where the original discs are or even what sort of discs they were. Were they 10 inch discs, 12 inch discs, 16 inch discs? Nobody knows. That Tosca opened the very first night of what has been for the past 90 years, our home. And it's a beautiful house. And clearly those who were fortunate enough to be there that Saturday evening, October 15th, thought so too. We're fortunate to also have the pre-performance tour of the house that was broadcast by NBC that evening, taking us on a bit of a walkabout. The full audio of which will be included in the project. So again, just a snippet here. The citizenry of San Francisco join me in a greeting of welcome and in extending you a cordial invitation to join us in the glory of the opera, a dream long denied fulfilled and the opera house in which the most enthusiastic opera lover could feel a just and glowing pride. Tonight, San Francisco celebrates the completion of the War Memorial Group, the Veterans Building, and the Opera House, at a cost of over five millions of dollars. Lovely women, furs, jewels, livery cars, all combined to paint a picture reminiscent of the early days when San Francisco first became noted as an opera center, when Caruso, Journey, Schumann Heinz, and Melba, world-renowned stars of another day, too numerous to mention, thrilled Western audiences with their golden voices. To tell the newcomers that we're attending opening night in the new War Memorial Opera House in San Francisco, and that in a few minutes, we will hear the first act of Tosca. San Francisco had a regular presence on the radio through one of radio's greatest periods, the 1970s. We even won a Peabody Award for our radio broadcast back in 1980, and in particular for the intermission features. One of the highlights from that period is the November 4, 1977 broadcast of Puccini's Turandot, when two great stars, Luciano Pavarotti and Montserrat Caballé, were singing their roles for the first time. Joined by a very young Leona Mitchell, also in a role debut, and conductor Ricardo Chailly in his American debut, and a new production by the iconoclastic designer director, Jean-Pierre Ponel. It was quite an occasion something that was never captured in a recording stool and that didn't ever happen anywhere else. I mentioned Pavarotti and Caballé in relation to the contextual audio earlier. Let's listen to a charming little snippet from an interview that was conducted right after that opening night and broadcast during the intermission. Welcome, Senora Caballé, Senor Pavarotti. In both of your cases, you're going into somewhat of a new repertory, more dramatic and, and heavier roles than you've sung before. How does a singer know when he or she is ready to sing a Turandot or a Kalaf? The day after the performance. <laughs> Not before. I Not agree. Before. <laughs> well, I guess you know that you're ready then. And we would be remiss if we didn't also share a little sampling of the performance that they're talking about there. 
Here is part of the riddle scene from Turandot where the princess is warning the mysterious stranger that there are three riddles, but one certainty for guessing incorrectly, death. But he has other ideas. And to wrap up, uh, we wanted to go through some of the challenges of streaming the first century. First of all, there are some gaps in our preserved audio history. Nothing was captured or saved from the first decade. Um, there's an early, shall we say, San Francisco opera adjacent recording, which is a 1925 piano roll made by our founder, Gaetano Merola. Uh, it's all music from Sanson and Dalila, and we're, we'll include that. Um, the 1950s are another gap, very unfortunate, because that was a great decade for the, for the company, where a lot of important U.S. debuts occurred then. Uh, Renata Tabaldi, Boris Kristof, uh, Birgit Nilsson, Leonie Riesnick, many more. Merla conducted San Francisco Opera on the Standard Hour early in that decade, of course, but uh, those were concerts for this project. We're, see we're sticking with opera performances and maybe a piano roll or two. And as you heard Ward Marston describe, uh, the sources for many of our early recordings are unknown, lost, or second, third, fourth generation copies. But do we need to hear Regine Crespan and John Vickers in the US professional stage debut of Berlioz's Les Troyennes in subpar sound? I think we do. Don't ask, don't tell. I am a big proponent of accepting whatever recording slides across my desk, which is a good thing given that 99% of our holdings from the 1960s are straight up bootlegs, or as some of my colleagues prefer that we call them unauthorized recordings. The sound quality can be a bit dodgy depending upon if it was recorded at home, off the radio, or while sitting in the orchestra section with a tape recorder smuggled in under one's coat. And of course, the legal considerations here can get a bit murky. Publishers' permissions, composers and artists' rights, libretto versions all play into what we can and cannot include, or in some cases, how much it's going to cost us to include something, or if it is simply cost prohibitive. Union agreements also need to be combed through to be sure we are adhering to our contracts on both sides and that all artists are fairly compensated. But perhaps the biggest challenge has been one of our resources in the form of time and staff. The pandemic has thrown so many things off kilter, particularly for those of us that work in the performing arts sector. Top priority has been getting back to a place where we can safely create art on our stage again, which meant that this project didn't get approved until mid-January of this year. We headed back into rehearsals for the summer season in the beginning of May. That left us with February, March, and April to work with our media teams to get through the bulk of the audio work. Migration, audio cleanup, QCing, many, many iterations, and mastering the final output in three months. Union conversations, artist letters and permissions, internal review, and all of the contemporary voice gathering and compiling of historic, historic ephemera is in the process also. And believe it or not, this isn't the only project that we're leading. Oh, well, yeah, and not to mention our day jobs, right? All that said, I think I speak for both Jeff and I when I say that this might be the most kick-ass project to come out of our centennial. And we really hope that come September, you all take a listen and go down into the rabbit hole with us and let us know what you think. Lastly, a huge shout out to our media, artistic and web teams, all those contributing new contemporary content and our union partners. This project could not happen without every single one of us. Thank you.
must be questions. We left some um, mystery out there. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the question, are there any questions is a good question. Um, and I am looking right now. Um, not currently any questions in the Q and A, um, but I, I actually have a question to start off with, if, if I may. Um, so I, I'm curious if there's any um, contemporary operas that you, you'd like to highlight on, on your site. Um, I know that could be a copyright challenge, um, but, I, but I would think that San Francisco has, has done its share of commissions. For sure, yeah. And actually this season we're opening up with something that I think the, the whole operatic world might be looking at San Francisco in September because we're opening up with a new um, opera by John Adams, uh, Antony and Cleopatra. And we just today announced a new cast update for that opera. But this is something that was commissioned and um, designed to open the centennial season. And you know, Antony and Cleopatra is just one aspect of this company's great history of commissioning new works, but also being a, a place where we presented the, the US premiere of a lot of important works that you know, uh, opened earlier in, in Europe, like De Frau and a Schatten, um, Les Enfants et les Sortilèges, uh, Dialogues of the Carmelites, performed here for the first time, Benjamin Britten's um, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a, it's a long list. It's kind of a great legacy and something we're really proud of here. And um, I will say that some of those US premieres will be reflected in the project. We have to be a little elusive there, sorry. <laughs> we want to keep some mystery for it. And as we were saying, you know, there are going to be four releases timed to what's going on on the stage. So one in September, one in October, one in November, one in December. So well, I, think I think ours, sorry. What's that? I think our members want as much dirt as you can give them, frankly. Um, <laughs> but uh, especially the, the, the really nitty gritty audio stuff. Um, I had a, another question. Um, I, mean, I was just looking at, at the at the archive website and um, like other orchestras and, and opera uh, companies, you've put up a lot of performance data um, around all your performances. You've added all these great features. I'm curious if there's any broader um, um, uh, sharing initiative going on in the opera performance world to kind of like Get all this data together and aggregate it um, so that you can do you can see do some like uh, computational things with it or just see a wider landscape. Okay, this is funny because Jeff and I talk about this at least once a week. That it is there's sort There's's of our shared language. fantasy that at some point we can get all the major opera houses together to build a universal database around opera happening in America. We could, of course, expand it beyond America um, that could not only compile all that information, but also provide a space where smaller opera companies could contribute as well without having to have sort of a financial investment. You know, if the big guys sort of took it on, we could do that. So yeah, we're with you on that one, but we'll, first we got to get through the centennial, right, Jeff? Yes, yes. And I just want to say, you know, I, I was involved with the Met Opera Database, which put all the, the Met's, you know, 137 years of history online for free. And I love uh, the platform we use. It looks a little web 2.0 now, but it still answers every single question you can throw at it. And, and I would love to see, like we were talking about Claudia Muzio earlier, to type in a, a general search for Claudia and get her Met career, her Chicago career, and definitely you know all these performances that she did with us here in San Francisco. And same for you know Milo and Eileen Perez, and and just that kind of comprehensive approach. And like I said, Tom, you're you're speaking our language. You should come to one of our little coffee chats next week. <laughs> Would love it, and I just want to thank you both for your presentation. It's very, it's very interesting what you what you're all doing. Um, so thank you for presenting thank today. You, Tom.